needed. Uh, okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, I believe that we are still getting some participants trickling in, so um, we'll just wait another second or two before we get going. Um, I don't know about my other uh, presenters today, but um, I'm fine if people wish to leave their cameras off, but if you'd like to turn them on so we can kind of see you, feel totally free. Um, I'm obviously sharing, so I might not be able to see everyone's faces. So uh, it's completely up to you how you would like to um, do that. All right. I'll rearrange my screen and then we'll get going. Okay, so I think I'm going to get going. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to our presentation today, um, Empowering Learners by Creating Student-Centered Hybrid Instruction Using H5P. Uh, my name is Matt Ruiter. I'll introduce my other presenters in just a moment. Um, but again, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming to our presentation today. Um, we hope that you uh, get a lot out of it. Um, we're, we're pretty proud of what we've done with H5P so far. All right, oops, all right. Uh, so a little bit about us to get started. Um, so as I said, my name is Matt Reeder. Um, also uh, presenting with me today is Meredith Fisher and Pauline Dewan. Uh, so we are three librarians from Laurier University uh, and we're part of a group of, uh, a larger group of librarians um, called the Online uh, Learning Group at Laurier. Uh, and we've been working with H5P for about two years now. Um, and one of the reasons why we kind of got started with H5P is we were looking for alternatives or different uses and different ways to create um, innovative and engaging uh, learning objects. And we really saw a lot of potential in H5P, um, mainly because of their, their mandate to empower everyone to create, share, and reuse interactive content. Uh, so we really found a, a good, Kind of linkage with H5P that would adhere to our values and our mandates um, and move forward with what we were doing for students. So uh, just to give a, a little bit of context in terms of what we're doing today, first and foremost, I'm actually using or we're using an H5P content type today as our uh, presentation um, tool. Uh, this is called an interactive book. And uh, one of the things that the interactive book kind of does for you is it allows you to create a um, an easy way to work through um, a concept or multiple concepts integrating a lot of different H5P content. Uh, so this is one of the big things that we wanted to do today was kind of like integrate as many different H5P uh, elements as we could. So what we're hoping to do today is, as I said, we really, uh, H5P has changed how we as librarians really engage our learners in understanding information literacy, as well as our practice in creating online asynchronous content, which had a very large role over the last two years, obviously. Um, and what we're really hoping to highlight today is the ways that we have utilized H5P. In particular, uh, we're gonna look a lot at collaboration and her hybridization. Um, using H5P and the tools that we have kind of created and work with. As well, I'll talk a little bit about in a moment uh, uh, issues of accessibility in H5P. So I kind of figure that if you're here, if you're at tests, you're already familiar with H5P. Uh, eCampus Ontario, of course, has been doing a lot of really great work. Where I just saw a chat. Uh, Exactly, showing by doing. Thank you, Ellie. Um, so, uh, if you've um, if you're at TESS, you're familiar with H5P. At least I um, hope so. Uh, they've put a lot of uh, work into it. They've done a lot of different workshops around H5P. So, I'm just we're sort of assuming that you have some familiarity with it. Uh, but to kind of just give you a bit of a basic uh, understanding is that it's a uh, free open source tool for creating interactive online content. And one of the other really big parts of what uh, we're doing is there's a lot of different um, parts of this presentation which are interactive. And what I'll do in a moment once I'm, um, I pass the, uh, the baton over to Meredith is I will put a link to the interactive book in the chat um, or, or I'll make sure that you can get the, the link so that um, you can kind of go through and explore our content and see the things that we're doing try out some of the different content types, try out some of the different interactive tools and things like that. Um, so we're gonna make sure that you're going to be able to work with the material as you go along. Oh, that's a blank slide. That's not supposed to be there. All right. 
So as a, a very brief introduction, as I, as I said, I hope people kind of are familiar with it, but H5P allows you to create 40 different content types, um, a great deal of them which are interactive. And using these interactive content types, they help increase engagement for users, as well you can embed them in a number of different kinds of places. And we, as I'll talk about in a moment, have embedded them in the library and different learning management systems. But one of the big parts or big benefits of H5P is the way that you can reinforce learning by helping users uh, review concepts or ideas. And in that way, they can also be scaffolded a lot of the time. Um, and I know that uh, both uh, Pauline and Meredith are going to be talking a little bit about um, scaffolding and um, some of these different aspects around um, engagement. With H5P, uh, you can create a lot of different learning objects that ensure a higher level of engagement for your students. Um, so for example, um, with H5P, you can encourage students to learn at their own pace. So kind of going in with some issues around universal design for learning and ensuring that they can work through the ideas presented in a way that they can process um, on their own time or that they can kind of grow familiar with the different ideas. Um, and you can also help their understanding of the concepts by reinforcing those ideas through different content types. Um, but below, uh, below, you'll find a course presentation that I've uh, used that kind of demonstrates a lot of different elements in H5P and allows for self-paced learning. So again, when you get the link to the book, you can take some time and explore those different concepts. So at, at Laurie, as I said, we saw potential for how well H5P can kind of work with some of our ideas. And we investigate H5P and eventually create our own, um, created our own local implementation um, of H5P. Um, at any time that you want to use H5P, you need to implement it locally. There's no sort of like central global server, so you have to kind of create your own system for H5P. And currently we have over 200 plus learning objects within H5P. Um, we have embedded it within our learning management system at Laurier, and we've also embedded it uh, within the library website as well. Um, and it really became an essential tool throughout the pandemic, um, as Pauline and Meredith are going to talk about. And before I just wrap up, I just wanted to point out uh, that one of the other really big parts of H5P is how easily it can work with accessibility issues. Um, so keeping in mind that um, it is very accessible, but not all content types are going to be uh, accessible uh, across the board. Um, and I've included a image hop spot below so you can tell um, different ways that the different content types are accessible. So h5p.org lists every single type of accessible uh, content type um, and they can tell you how to use it, different ways it can be used or, um, for accessibility purposes. So um, I've included links to that guide as well and a uh, quick easy way to understand whether or not things are accessible. But one of the things that I uh, do also recommend that even though um, content types are accessible, um, those can still have some issues around accessibility. So for example, an audio content type, only the full player is accessible. Or if you're dealing with an image hotspot, the order you put the hotspots in um, to the image, that might not be exactly how the screen reader is going to read it. And two really big final tips around accessibility in, um, in H5P is always consider issues around universal design for learning. It can make it accessible for everyone um, and create ways to focus and guide learning throughout your content type. And secondly, anytime that you're working with um, H5P, always just keep accessibility in mind and you will find that it can be an easy way to incorporate those kind of issues as you go along. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let Meredith take up the baton. Thanks, Matt. That was great. Okay. So sharing my screen now. I hope you can all see that. And I will expand the interactive book. There we go. Yeah, so librarians do a lot of collaborating and H5P uh, gives us the ability to do that collaboration in a flexible way, whether we're teaching in person or online, synchronously, asynchronously, or in a hybrid way, with lots of time for planning or with only a little bit of time for planning. 
Um, Pauline, Matt, and I are part of a group, as Matt mentioned, um, and that group, um, the online instruction functional group, um, collaborated on a local H5P implementation. So this H5P object that you see below the text, um, this is an image hotspot in H5P, and it shows our catalog. Um, so if I click on the first little hotspot on the image, um, you can check out this hot this um, catalog at h5p.wlu.ca. Um, we have over 207 objects in the catalog to date. Really popular content types are course presentations. Um, you've seen several of those so far. Columns, which you'll see in examples coming up, and interactive videos. And then we also, um, in our local implementation, created custom subjects to help us organize and navigate the H5P catalog. So if you go to the site, you'll see some of the subjects listed there, and those are very much based on our current use of the site, and they're intended to help other librarian creators navigate the pre-existing content. Um, and that does really feed into the collaborative potential of H5P. So next I'll talk about some specific features of H5P that can facilitate collaboration and I'll use some examples um, from my own work. So H5P makes it really easy to um, copy and paste content for reuse and to use Creative Commons licenses to share objects as open educational resources or OERs. And this way you can really put more time into creating something new and innovative um, while at the same time reusing content that you've already created or that maybe you reuse a lot um, and don't need to recreate. Um, so as one example, I worked with an instructor teaching, a, it was a social work and healthcare course. Um, so we worked together to figure out some of the issues students were struggling with around uh, doing research. Um, and so instead of re recreating things that I knew they would also benefit from, like let's say videos around how to search for uh, peer reviewed journal articles, which I had already created for other courses, I reused that content and then created content to address some of the problem issues students were experiencing. So um, things like, why do I need to use um, academic sources in the first place? Um, what are academic sources? How do I identify them? So this is a course presentation I created around that. Um, I was also able to create um, this worksheet. This is uh, a worksheet created using the documentation tool in H5P, and it's intended to help students in the same course, the health, uh, the social work and healthcare course, around uh, a knowledge mobilization assignment. So they use this documentation tool. Um, which outputs a document at the end to create a knowledge mobilization plan that will be useful for their final assignment. So I was able to put more time into planning this piece out as well while reusing pre-existing content. My cats love Zoom and always get in the way, so <laughs> there may be another one coming up in a minute. Um, so uh, H5P makes it really easy to um, adapt pre-existing content as well. So um, you can create a bank of learning objects. This is something that I've done. And then um, present them as examples when you're working with someone else, which you can then adapt later on to suit the context at hand. Um, you can also add or remove interactions um, and adapt to synchronous or asynchronous instruction, depending on what you're doing. So in my first example here, this is a course presentation that I created for first year students around reading strategies. So it's very basic level and it presents students with some tips and tricks for improving their reading skills um, when they're reading um, academic books and articles. Then when I met with a, an instructor teaching a fourth year course, I used it as, ex, as an example of what I could do. And she thought her students would really benefit from it. Instead of just reusing the same content though, uh, I adapted the content for a fourth year course. So for upper year students, I've got learn to read like a peer reviewer 
And it reuses some of the content in the basic structure, but builds more information into it. So it's sort of scaffolded. Um, and in my third example around adaptability, this is a video that I created for a course um, I was teaching synchronously. So I was in a live session and I had intended to use it, but ran out of time. So I added interactions to the quiz or to the, um, sorry, to the video and sent it to students so that they could engage with it later on. So the little circles above the timeline indicate an interaction. You, you'll see when you watch the video, this little quiz button pops up. And when you click it, you get a true or false question in this case based on the content of the video so far. So it'll pause and students answer the true or false question and then gauge their learning in the self-assessment. So um, H5P also allows you to assemble objects in different ways uh, to fit a particular mode or style of delivery. Um, and so in example number one, this is a single page module that I created for a very bare bones general orientation site in the LMS. So other content in this course site was very, very basic. And I put together uh, this column, which I embedded in the learning management system for students reusing content I had already created. So introduction to the library for online students is actually a video that a colleague of mine created that I added into this column. And I reuse the video again, in my second example, I've got a multi-page module created for a discipline specific orientation site in the LMS. And this orientation site um, was much more advanced. It had much more detailed comp content. So other contributors like writing support had created like a um, complex multi-part module. So I did the same to follow the, the, the expectation of students in the site. And I put together different learning objects, created some new learning objects in a three-part module that culminates in um, a quiz. And so here's that video reused um, in this module, but it's a much more complex and built out module that, that includes many different H5P content types. And finally, um, H5P's scalability means that you can plan for substantial OER projects or just create like one-off single OER learning objects. My example is just a really basic accordion I created for one in-class activity. So I use this live um, and explain to students what they were to do. It's based on one of their readings for the week. So we look at different sources used in the reference list of that reading and talk about film studies research. Um, this interactive book is a scaled up example of um, an OER project. So we, Matt, Pauline and I collaborated to make this book. Um, as a final note around collaboration in H5P though, I would say one drawback is that you can't collaborate on a single object when you're working on um, an H5P project. So for example, Matt, Pauline and I could not like edit this interactive book at one time. We had to um, create one instance of it and the next person had to copy and paste it and then work on it. And then the next person had to copy and paste the final piece um, to finish it up. So you have to coordinate working on and editing um, a single project when you're um, trying to co-create something. So next I'm gonna pass it on to Pauline. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Okay, thanks Meredith. Hi everyone. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna show you three examples that I've used in hybrid instruction and specifically uh, to reinforce learning, uh, to scaffold learning, and to use in the flipped classroom. And then I'm gonna summarize uh, advantages of using H5P for your students and for you. So 
Um, one of the ways I often teach is to use H5P in a live or synchronous session and then follow up in the LMS with added content that reinforces what I did live. Um, so here's an example of a combination of content types that I used all in one uh, synchronous session. So I'll just go back up to the top. So this page itself is a column content type. And you can see that it acts as a container for other content types. So in the class, I sent the column link to my students and I asked them to click on this video and then answer the quiz question. Uh, my idea was to spark their curiosity right in the beginning of the session um, by getting them to answer a question. And then I have here um, an image hotspot. I think someone was asking about that. So basically the little icon just provides additional information here. And I used that image hotspot to talk about different types of uh, information. And then I went to um, an accordion and each of these, as you've seen previously by Matt and Meredith, uh, they open up to additional information. I love this content type because it gives a nice overview of information and then the details are behind it. And then I created uh, a course presentation uh, and I taught from this presentation and it really applied everything uh, that I have been talking about up till now one particular example. And then in the uh, LMS, I added another course presentation. And in this one, um, I really talked about what I was doing before, but in a slightly different way. And I felt like that was really reinforcing the entire session here. Okay, so let me move on here. So scaffolded learning. So oftentimes in teaching, we want to present ideas in a scaffolded way that build upon earlier knowledge, step by step. So I showed a series of very short videos with some discussion in between. So the first one is just some general research tips. The second one applies those to our library catalog. And then the third one applies those to the um, library databases, which are a little bit more difficult. So using three discrete objects helped break the session into a series of stepping stones for them. I then uploaded those videos to the LMS, and then I added a quiz question, which again built upon everything that was in the videos. Um, I don't actually see the answer to that quiz question, but I think it's really useful for students in any way. So the flipped classroom. So H5P is really great for the flipped classroom. So I asked students to watch this video and then afterwards um, in class, like they watched this before, and then in the class, I had them answer these questions. And those questions help spark discussion about primary sources, uh, which I found to be a very useful way of teaching. So just in summary here, to talk about these advantages. So we've seen that H5P has a variety of content types that really help a broad range of learning styles. And they also make it interesting, which is no easy feat. Um, great for students with the quizzes, they can self-assess. And then because you can put things in the LMS, it will facilitate self-paced learning. For instructors, um, you've got lots of selection from which to choose. And as you can see, it works well synchronously and asynchronously. Um, to me, the best part is you can copy and customize previously created objects like Meredith showed you. And H5P is very adaptable 
Um, it's scalable and can be used in so many different combinations. So here I've got one question for you if you want to answer it afterwards. And I think we're done here and we're ready to go and see if you have any questions for us. So Anne, if we've got anything else in the chat. What's our platform? So I think it's um, the, the fact that we're using a H5P a content type, the interactive book. Um, so rather than using PowerPoint or something like that, we actually created the entire presentation using an H5P uh, content type. I can answer that question. You can't get you can't get assessment data, unfortunately. Um, so um, H5P is great for many things, but unfortunately, the way it is now, there's no assessment data you can get. I see Ali has a question there. Why is this better than other tools that are embedded in LMS platforms or better than PowerPoint? It's a good question, Ali, because I know it's like another tool, right? But H5P is actually pretty easy to pick up for most people once you have experience with other tools, especially. One really important feature of H5P is that you only have to do updates from one place. So from the H5P catalog that I showed you in the hotspot, I can update one object and everywhere it's embedded, it will be updated. So um, that makes life a lot easier when you have the same content in many different places, for sure. So that's just one reason it truly is a game changer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I teach MBAs and I have one particular, a couple of different um, H5P things in, um, I think, nine different um, MBA courses. And rather than have to like go into nine different my learning spaces, I can just change it once and the um, and all that content automatically gets updated every semester. And it's a, it's a really great feature. Yeah, so good question, Cheryl, about the assessment data. So even when you create the assessment, you're really creating it for the student to answer themselves, but there's no way the instructor can actually see that. So I've used those quizzes in class and I'll, I'll get people to answer them, but then I will just ask them verbally, okay, so what were you thinking? And I find it helps for me uh, to just as a catalyst to further discussion. And I think it helps students when you put it in the LMS, if they're just interested in testing their own knowledge, that's how the assessment piece works. But you're not able to actually get assessment data from that. Uh, so Sabrina, but what I meant by the 200 different learning objects is that that is how many that uh, the librarians at Laurier have created. Um, so when we implemented H5P, we actually did a number of different workshops training um, all the librarians on H5P. Some adapted it, some did not. Um, but now we have a catalog of um, 200 plus uh, H5P um, uh, content types and it's uh it, it's accessible by whomever we give the the link to so as I've, we've been saying like if we embed a certain content type in um, a learning management system those students who have access to it will be able to access uh, get ac get access to that content um whereas so it is a private server it's it's law we have to log in but then we can share that content however we like Yeah, and just to be clear, um, you can't create content from our catalog, but there's an eCampus Ontario um, H5P catalog that's wonderful. There's tons of examples in it. So you can um, log in there. You can, you can, I think you have to like 
register for free if you live in Ontario and you can create a login and create content there. Much of our content um, has a cre Creative Commons licenses assigned to them. Um, the, the, uh, each of the objects, depending on who creates it, will assign um, a Creative Commons license to it. Um, so you could reuse some of the content in our catalog. So I've just gotten a message from eCampus. Unfortunately, the, we are at time, um, so we will have to wrap up. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, and if anybody has follow-up questions, please um, feel free to contact myself, Pauline or, or Meredith, and we'll be happy to, um, uh, to further discuss um, H5P. We, talk, we like talking about it, so. Thanks, everybody.